All right, hey everybody, welcome to Drum Talk TV. Dan Schinder here, uh, and I want you to all say hello to my guest, Rod Morgenstein. So happy to have him on the show. It's been, ooh, I think three years or something since we've had Rod on. So uh, welcome, Rod, and tell us where you're watching from, everybody. Rod, how are you? I am doing well, Dan. I'm coming to you from my home on Long Island, New York. Awesome. East Coast, West Coast. Oh, I kind of moved from the edge of West Coast so I don't break off into the ocean with the rest of California eventually trying to get my sons to move out of San Diego. But we live in Arizona now. Uh, Drum, TV, Drum Talk TV is based in Globe, Arizona, about 100 miles east of Phoenix in the mountains. Total change of pace here has been great. So, gosh, there's so much that we want to talk about with Rod. And, folks, don't only tell us not only where you're watching from, but I will take a few questions from the audience at some point. Rod, what I'd love to start with, and I feel so bad that I missed this when you came to Arizona, let's talk about the Dixie Dregs reunion tour. How exciting was that to get back together with everybody? It was an extraordinary experience uh, on many levels. Um, let's see, I think the last time that the band had toured was about 12 years ago. And um, the thing that made this particular tour so special is that it was the first time in 40 years that, that the original lineup from the very first commercially released album were all on stage together. And you're the only one that looks the same. Yeah, yeah, not, <laughs> thank you, but uh, not quite. So, um, Andy so, Smith, yes. <laughs> so, you know, that album was called Free Fall. It was released in the spring of 1977. And that lineup uh, really only lasted for about a year because after we toured for that record, uh, the keyboard player, whose name was Steve David Owski, who we nicknamed Owski, um, left the band and then um, a new keyboard player came in after uh, Steve Davidowski. So I hadn't seen him in God knows how many years. And, uh, you know, I, I had been talking about doing some kind of special reunion of the Dixie Dregs with our manager, Frank Solomon, who also happens to be the manager of Dream Theater. I have lived with Frank and his family for the past 20 years uh, teaching in Boston at Berklee College of Music. So I've been right. part of their family. Um, I live, like I said, on Long Island in New York, which is about 240 some odd miles door to door to Berkeley. So I have been doing this ridiculous commute uh, <laughs> several hundred times, but I've lived with Frank Solomon. And so on many of the occasions when I would be up in Boston staying with them, uh, we would canvas the possibility of doing something really different and special with the Dixie Dregs. And so, uh, you know, the idea was, hey, what if we put together the very original lineup of the band and, and tried to do it in a very classy way? So we're not going to play clubs where the band goes on late and people stand we're going to try and do it in a in a little bit more upscale sophisticated fashion playing oh, like a real tour like a real tour playing beautiful theaters yeah and having it be an evening with where we do two long sets showtime starts about 8 p.m and everybody gets to sit That's so um i mean it's been being talked about for years. And so what finally happened was January a year ago, um, all five members uh, made the time so that we could all convene at Steve Morse's um, place down in Florida. Wait, and, yeah. excuse me, before you continue with that, let, let's insert something. Before it got to that point, Rod, what was the reception like with each member when it was brought up? 
I, I think everybody uh, was extremely excited and um, curious about what would happen if the five of us convened in a room together after all these years yeah. to see what would happen um, if we all practiced a handful of songs and played together. Okay. And um, so we got together at Steve's for a couple of days and you know, we ran through five or six songs that we had all agreed uh, to brush up on. And, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't play at a full blown volume. We were in a small room um, with a, I had a small drum set up and I played really with uh, like Vic Firth Rute. Yeah, you know, the, it, yeah light it was like so a halfway downwards. unplugged environment in a way, right? Yeah. yeah, and everybody had small amplifiers. And, um, you know, fortunately, as human beings, we really hit it off. There's so much history when you go back to the early years of a band struggling to try to make it, to get a record deal. And then, uh, you know, like following the course of events that happened way back in those days. So we were all part of that. Uh, some of us fresh out of college, which is where I met Steve Morse and Andy and um, so here we went, were at Steve's, had the best time over those two days. This is January of uh, 2017. And then it was a question of figuring out the logistics of how easy or difficult is this going to be to get five people who live in five different parts of the country, who have five different careers. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how can we manage to get everybody to find a window of opportunity to where we could all pull this thing together and go tour the country. And yeah. so, you know, so a lot of that fell in the lap of Frank Solomon, our manager, and uh, you know, he pulled together this wonderful tour that overall was a huge success. And, um, uh, and we kind of all left with a, with a wonderful taste in our mouths. And so, you know, the future is always uncertain. Um, but there's a hope that maybe we can manage to do something uh, on this level again. Now, the tour being successful as it was, there have been promoters around the world that have begun to put out feelers to see if the band might be available, you know, next summer to perhaps play festivals in Europe and maybe some things in Asia and other parts of the world. So, so we'll see if any of these things, you know, can come together. But, you know, the thing is, the Dixie Dregs um, is such a special part of all of our lives because it's the band that kick-started all of our careers. Yeah. And it had such, and does, have such a... I hate to use this word, but I, I think it's true in the sense that it was for Rush for so many years a very cult following, a very loyal following of either musos or music fans who really get some music that takes a little bit more thinking and that you can hurt your hip dancing to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think part of the beauty of the music, which uh, really uh, comes from Steve Morse's um, writing, um, yes, there's no singing, so it's instrumental music. And yes, you could say, you know, it's this instrumental rock, jazz, fusion, classical country, um, this ethereal sound. Um, but when Steve writes uh, for this band, you know, over the years that we, we've done it, the audience is always a big consideration and, you know, some of us um, ha have always had the feeling that instrumental fusion music can sometimes be a little bit self-absorbing to where for the musicians creating it, they don't think so much about the audience. They just think about this really cool music that, that they're creating. And so Steve's writing really begins uh, with these beautiful melodies that are almost at times sing-songy, and you can almost be fooled 
into thinking you're listening to, I don't want to use the word easy listening right. uh, in the sense that we sometimes think but, about it. But something but, not so but, esoteric. Yes. So someone who isn't a musician at all might hear some of the music and go, hey, that's really melodic and, and I can follow it. And it might not necessarily even be in a straight ahead 4-4 four, four time signature, but it's it's so beautiful and easy to listen to that it's really music uh, for almost any lover of music. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's so cool. And then fast forward, it's time to get ready for the tour. And I'm sure you had real rehearsals with real amplifiers and drumsticks and had more of a dress rehearsal sort of environment as far as the sound reinforcement goes and everything. What was that like when now you're playing at 9 or 10 or cranking it up even maybe to 11 and just feeling it go through you in the room? What was that like to hear those songs again and feel what, them and play them like that all those years later? Well, let's see, like, well, first up, in all honesty, uh, you know, the rehearsals were, I believe, uh, six days, these long days in three different settings. The first two days were back at Steve's house playing quietly. Um, the next three days were in a rehearsal facility an hour or so from where the first venue was in Clearwater, Florida. And then the sixth and final rehearsal was in the venue. Perfect. And um, I have to say that in the very beginning of these uh, six days, things were not happening like any of us thought they would. It's like everybody was, for the most part, on their own, learning the the list of 20 some odd songs that we had agreed upon. And then when we when we all set up and, and set out to rehearse the first day, we called out a tune and we started playing it. And then lo and behold, we came to find that some of us in the band didn't learn all of the parts to the song because I'll give an example. Uh, our keyboard player, Steve David Alsky, Alsky, when we were playing the song Odyssey, which is a long, uh, you know. It's uh, an odyssey. <laughs> it's an odyssey that, that goes through many different changes. Yeah. When the first intense section started, he was sitting with his hands in his lap. So we stopped and said, Alski, why aren't you playing? And he said, on the recording, I didn't hear any keyboards. It just sounds like, you know, guitars and bass. All right. So it's an honest, um, I don't want to call it a mistake. It's just what his ears yeah. were not picking up keyboards. So, so what happened was, instead of just running the songs, it turned out to be a rehearsal where learning them again, right? of learning certain <laughs> parts of songs. And it really wasn't until the last day or two that we started running the songs. And wow. for, for me, you know, uh, it really was like we were on the edge of our seats yeah. at the very first gig, you know? There's a weird exhilaration that sometimes goes with that, you know? There, Rod froze for oh, yeah. Second, but we're back. oh yeah, yeah. There's this weird exhilaration that can go with that, as well as, you know, whether you call it fear or let's use the word concern. It's a little more positive. Um, so, how did that first gig go? I was terrified. I think everybody in the band was at least concerned, if not fearful. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing was, the audience was so with us. And it was the the audience seeing this lineup of the band for the first time on stage together since 1977, really. And, um, and so, you know, so everything went great. And then with each show, things really started tightening up. And then I'd say about a week into it, at least for me, I kind of started thinking, yeah, this is the band I remember. Oh, that is so cool. That's and, cool. And what was so nice is throughout the tour, um, and, you know, um, 
hanging out after the shows with with a lot of the fans. Um, the term so so many of us in the band were hearing from these fans was bucket list, bucket list. This is one of the things on my bucket list. I was wondering if this was ever going to happen in my lifetime again. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it was and very good. Were, were fans bringing, like, okay, so I'm going to tell on myself. Were fans bringing, like, I have kids and even grandkids to the gig to expose them to this this world that was part of the soundtrack of their lives, you know, like it was for me when I was younger? Yeah, sure. That's awesome. Of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, two and three generations. Yeah. I, you know, all, in my entire life, did I ever think I would be in a band, you know, where where people would be bringing their kids or grandkids? You know? Let alone that band 40 years later. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what was the behavior like between you guys on, not just at the rehearsals, but on tour? Did Did any of the same sort of, banter and and jokes and just sort of intermingling the way you used to when you were in your 20s come out when you're in your (laughs) (laughs) well of course and you know the thing is um when you play in a band anyone who's out there watching this uh, who's a musician and has played in bands there's all these like inside stories um that only you and your bandmates. Yeah. yeah right? And, and I bet not all of them remembered all of them either. So sometimes someone was probably going, oh, yeah, or something, right? Well, that happened all the time. But but yeah. what made this even greater was the fact that when the word got out a year ago that we were putting this together, we then started uh, getting phone calls from people who worked with us on the road crew all those years ago. Oh, wow. And so um, three out of four of the main crew with us uh, were were from those days all the way wow. back to 19, you know, 77 and 78. Uh, you know, yeah. we and they were a little concerned in terms of, you know, um, it used to be easy to sort of lift a Sir Win Vega cabinet or, a, or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, are you guys you know, going to be able to handle. Because right. let's face it, they're, they're in their 60s now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our keyboard player is 75. Wow, I never thought to realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody in their 60s and 70s. Although we also, we brought along our manager's son, Jake Solomon, who's in his 20s, and he was a tremendous help. Great. Um, but, you know, the person who tour managed and did sound for us, Jeff Burkhart, started working with us way back around 1977 or 78. He was the club manager of of a place in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> and, and the first or second time that we played there, he said, you know, I, I'm really not happy here. Uh, I, I'd love to go on the road with you guys if if there's something I could do. And so we hired him back in 1977, 78 for $75 a week because that was all we could afford back then. And so Jeff went on to become one of the most accomplished lighting designers in in the business. He did Shania Twain for many years. And, uh, you know, he wrote an autobiography and in it, 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 it's a list of, Who's who? Yeah. In terms of the arena bands that he has worked with over the years. So now he had retired several years ago, but you know he was the first to call and say, "Wait a second, guys, I'm in. I'm coming out of retirement to do wow. this." As did uh, Scoots Linden, who's the younger brother of Twigs Linden, who, you know, in the grand scheme of the rock uh, music business, was an icon. Uh, Twigs Linden was the production manager for the Allman Brothers who yeah. found his way to the Dixie Dregs in those early years. And uh, and then he brought his brother Scoots aboard. And so Scoots uh, was my drum tech on the tour and, and did monitors. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, it, 
it was it was wonderful. And then a guy who had done sound for us way back then, for a while, Gary Sharp, he did sound for us. And so um, this wonderful thing. And then just for for Steve's guitar, he brought out his guy Tommy, who has been doing guitars for him in Deep Purple for the last umpteen years. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so cool. Before we move on to some future business going on to Winger, the polar opposite musically, which is so great about you as a musician. Before we go on to that, I'd like you to retell a story that you told in your very first Drum Talk TV interview that I didn't do. You did it with Simon Fishburne, who's an Australian that covered a Bonzo Bash for us on the East Coast years ago. And you told this great story, since we're talking about the beginnings of your career and everything, about a conversation you had with your dad and something he asked you about your name. Ah. <laughs> okay, if, if I'm remembering this correctly. So um, when I started uh, to begin to make a name for myself in, in the drumming world, uh, my dad asked me if I was thinking about changing my name as as so many people in the United States do if they have an ethnic sounding last name right. uh, they'll either shorten it or change it to something so um, um, so anyway so my last name is Morgan Steen so um, I had said to him no I mean that's that's my name and uh, so I, I think I'm fine with just Keeping it that way. Okay, so now, fast forward to 1986. Um, the Dixie Dregs had uh, ended until further notice, as did the Steve Morse band, where I had continued on playing with Steve Morse uh, in a trio. Mm -hmm. And then that ended until further notice because Steve ended up joining the group Kansas right. that was reforming, and they asked him to join. And so... I ended up through uh, a series of events moving to Hanover, Germany to join a band called Zeno, spelled Z-E-N-O, mm -hmm. that had reportedly signed the largest record deal in history for a new band. Wow. Uh, the, the older brother of the guitarist in Zeno was Uli Roth, who many guitarists would, would know. Uli Roth plays to this day, he's an incredible guitarist, and Uli was the original guitarist in the Scorpions, yeah. metal band from Germany. Yeah. So, but Uli wasn't in Zeno, it was his brother, Joe, or Jochum. So, so here I am, I'm living in a little apartment in Hanover, Germany, rehearsing with this band Zeno, uh, getting ready to play some shows in Europe. And so one day, we're eating some food and we're having a conversation and I don't know how it came up, but the conversation of uh, me having my father ask me, you know, back when I started to get, get a little popular uh, about whether I was thinking of changing my name. So when I mentioned it, these three Germans started, uh, you know, talking back and forth in German and they turned to me and they said, is wrong with Rod? <laughs> so, so, uh, and the, the, thing, the, sound the blipped, thing that was so funny. I'm sorry, the sound blipped out for just a moment. What Rod said is that the alternative and said, what's wrong with Rod? <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So they couldn't believe that my dad was thinking, you know, I would change my name Rod. <laughs> To, to like Bill Morgenstein or um, it never once occurred to them that it was Morgenstein that my dad um, was, was referring, referring to. to. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was a very important lesson for me learning that humor or things do not necessarily translate from one culture to another because right. in, in Germany, the name Morgenstein has a very cool ring to it. And, you know, there's a very famous heavy band from Germany called Ramstein or Ramstein. Yes. And it's a great, has a great English translation as well. 
Yeah, Morgenstein means morning stone. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it was just, it's one of those very funny stories. And so, it's so, so funny, while, yeah. While I'm on uh, this um, topic of talking about when I played in the German band Zeno, another quick story. One day uh, I, was, I was with the bass player, Ulla Ritgen, and he said, oh, I have to stop at my parents' house for a minute. I said, sure. So we walk in his house and he introduces me to his father, you know, and they speak in German. He goes, this is Rod. And I go, oh, hi, nice to meet you. His father spoke very little English, but he said to me, where in America are you from? And I said, oh, Atlanta. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And he said, oh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta burning, right? Atlanta burned. He said, who who burned Atlanta? Who marched? And I said, uh, oh, um, um, Sherman marched right in to Atlanta and burned it down. He goes, no, 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 not Sherman. And I said, yeah, Sherman. And he goes, not Sherman. <laughs> and he stormed out of the room. I, I, I felt terrible. You know, I just met my friends. Now, my friend was not in the room, my bandmate. Oh, who, oh really? <laughs> who just me and his dad. And so a few days later, Ula, the bass player, comes over to me laughing. And he said, Rod, when you left my parents' house, my dad was beside himself. He was so upset. And he said, why do the Americans blame the Germans for everything? <laughs> and so, so the thing is, in Germany, in in the language German, the letter G is is pronounced. Sh. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't a German a person for Germany wouldn't say I'm from Germany. They'd say I am from Germany. I am Sherman. Yeah. So he thought I was blaming Germany. <laughs> for the Germans march right in. You know. <laughs> wow, you causing international conflict just trying yeah. to be a drummer. <laughs> Awesome. And folks, if you have questions, I'm looking over here at our monitor. If you have questions, um, I will refer. Hey, everybody. Some people say hi, Niagara Falls. Where else are you watching from? Let's see. Philly. Great drummer, great guy. I don't know if they mean me or you. We'll give that <laughs> one to you. <laughs> um, watching in my 18-wheeler in Arkansas. Rod, you nice. played a clinic in Colorado Springs at Grainer Music, and I bought the Ludwig kit that you used for the clinic. You were amazingly music. You're amazing musically and personally. Thanks for all the great years you've given on the drums. That's really cool. Ah, thank you very and much. Then, yeah, fast forward there. He's watching you uh, on Drum Talk TV on the internet in his 18 wheeler. Incredible. And so if any of you have any comments, let us know. And I will take some questions from the audience in just a little while and just kind of scoot through here real quick. Uh, oh, so I'll ask one now since it's about the Dixie Drake's tour. Um, yeah. Kevin Hall is asking who else didn't Oh, I think I thought he was asking who else didn't learn the songs for the tour. <laughs> but it actually said, laugh out loud, if I had a buck for every time that's happened, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> so I guess it's kind of a, a common thing. Dr. Nadia Azar is watching. Nadia is uh, not only been on the show before, she's also going to be with us at our booth at the NAM show during interviews, specialized interviews, and I'm going to hook you up with her when you go on the winger tour because what Nadia does is she's, uh, she's a doctor, she teaches at Windsor University in Canada, and she's been doing this study on drummer injuries. And I don't mean when we whack ourselves in the nose or the groin or something, but like tendonitis, sciatica, back problems. And she's been getting with really great drummers like yourself, Rod, and applying an armband and measuring calories that they burn off for certain songs or for certain part of the set. And she's actually coming out here for three days and we're going to play a little game in my studio and stream it live and have people guess how many calories I burn off for certain things and give away some stuff. So I'll hook you up with Nadia. Nadia, thanks for watching. Looking forward to having you out here. Um, 
So now, and Kevin is saying there's a typo. I don't know if it's ours or his. So let's totally switch gears. When I say switch gears, folks, I don't mean just, hey, let's talk about another topic. Let's talk about another band. When you take the music of the Dixie Dregs and you take Rod's tasks and assignments and job as a drummer and a musician in the Dixie Dregs, and then you compare it to over here where we're going with Winger, it's a whole different world. And I always like to, to preach and say and get on my soapbox that you've got to learn and be good at as many genres as possible simply to make us all better musicians, even if it's learning music we're not that fond of to pick up tools to help apply to the music we're most fond of. So Winger, kind of for those who aren't familiar with the two bands or, or both, how would you compare the two? Well, let's see. Um, well, you, you know, it's a great analogy for Dixie Dregs. It's, you know, ethereal, it's country, it's progressive, it's rock fusion, jazz, it's, it's symphonic, it's all those yeah. things. It's a little bit of a lot of things. Now, the thing with Winger was um, when I met Kip Winger and Reb Beach, they were getting ready to go on their third or fourth go around of shopping demos to record companies in New York City. They already had been through every record label at least twice and had been rejected. That's crazy. Right, crazy. And, you know, and some of the songs that went on to be very big MTV video hits were songs that had been rejected two and three times before ultimately Atlantic Records agreed, uh, you know, to, to sign the band. So. The thing is, at least, you know, back then, life is so different now. The template for making it in music and, and really in a lot of different fields, it's kind of changed. But back then was you would submit a three or four song demo to record labels, either through a music attorney or making appointments yourself or calling the label. So it's what they called solicited. Um, and so the way that you would give yourself a chance of having a label be interested uh, in you was by listening to the music that was out there on the charts being played by radio and then seeing if the music that was inside you that you were writing could have certain elements of the music that record labels are signing. Now, if, if you're of the mindset where you go, I don't care what anybody says, I don't care what's out there, this is my music, take it or leave it. All right, well, what, what would happen back then for most people like that was you wouldn't get a record deal. Right. Right, because the label would say, what are, what are we supposed to do with this? You know, it doesn't fit anything that MTV is supporting with videos or that right. radio was playing. You know, so Kip, um, and Reb would kind of listen to everything that was out there at the time. So you had Bon Jovi and Kiss and Poison and Def Leppard, uh, you know, bands of that nature that were, you know, in, in the album top 20 of the Billboard charts. And so they would sort of use that as, as a measure uh, of their own to see if what they could come with could maybe have something that an A&R person at a record label could listen to and go, I, this could maybe fit the format, you know, right. of what's out there. And so, um, so ultimately, you know, after being passed on by everybody at least twice, uh, maybe three times, Atlantic Records took a shot on the band. And uh, fortunately for me, it was maybe six months before that all happened that I inadvertently met Kip and Reb um, at a Japanese management company where I was up there on different business. I was trying to get a tour, a month long tour as the drummer with one of this Japanese management company's artists by the name of Kitaro. Oh, yeah. Who was a new age artist. Yeah and was coming to America to do four, four or five weeks of touring. 
Yeah. And so while I was up there in the office, uh, there was this metal music coming from a clo behind a closed door of another room. And so I just inquired with the management person I was speaking to. I said, oh, I didn't know there's anybody else here. And he said, oh, come, I will introduce you. So the door opens and it's, I don't know these guys, it's Kip Winger and Reb Beach. And I do remember the demo that, was, that they were working on. It was a song called Madeleine. Yeah. That went on to become the very first single of yeah. that very first Winger record that, that got everything started yeah. for us a year later. But so when I was introduced to these guys, you know, Kip put out his hand. He said, hi, I don't know who you are, but Reb Beach was overly excited because he was a huge Dixie Dregs fan and a Steve Morse fan. And, you know, he was saying to Kip, you don't understand, you don't know who this guy is. <laughs> no. and, and what I didn't want to let them know was that at the time I was an unemployed musician who had just moved up from Atlanta, Georgia because the Dixie Dregs were on hiatus until further notice, as was the Steve Morse band. And I had just come back from Germany because the Zeno experience did not amass to anything. Mm. And so I found myself back in Atlanta, Georgia, twiddling my thumbs saying, what do I do now? I am bandless. I it's, need to. It's funny because I can't imagine that, you know. <laughs> you know, it, it's so interesting. I, Someone needs to write a book that interviews a hundred musicians that have quote unquote made it or had success on some level, just so um, that younger musicians who have this dream of a career in music could sort of read the stories, very, very short stories, just a few pages of these hundred musicians talking about those one or two or three lucky breaks that changed their lives and got them from anonymity into the inner circle of the music business. Yes. And I think everybody's story would be a little bit different. How was I to know that when I was in the office of a management company, hoping I would get a month long tour playing drums with a new age artist. And yeah. of course, you know, new age music was certainly not my cup of tea. Um, who would know that I would, in that same meeting, be introduced to two musicians that were going to become like the biggest thing that I've done in my career. Yeah, you, and you totally love, different music. How, how did that at the time match up with your music sensibilities or did you not care? Or what? Well, well here, yeah, the thing is, I'm a typical American kid, meaning I grew up um, listening. Well, it was the Beatles that got me started, just sitting with my family on Sunday night, watching the Ed Sullivan show, watching the Beatles on their first performance on that TV show, and immediately honing in on Ringo Starr and identifying with the drums and looking at my parents and my sister, Carol, saying, that's what I want to be when I grow up. So um, a year or two later, Jimi Hendrix hit the scene and Cream hit the scene. And then a year or two after that, Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull and Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Yeah. And then a year or two after that, the Mahavishnu Orchestra turned my world um, you know, upside down. Yeah. So, um, so in saying, you know, I was a typical American kid, I grew up loving rock music, you know? And so when I ultimately moved to New York City in 1986, looking for the next thing to do, a a huge part of me was really wanting to go back to my rock roots. 
not find another fusion band to play with. Right. But I wanted to maybe learn how to hit hard and, um, you know, maybe get to use some of the, the more, um, you know, fusion-y uh, co conceptual things that I had learned in all these previous years uh, studying the drums and playing in the Dixie Dregs. Um, but I really was also interested in maybe getting involved with rock musicians. And so yeah, yeah. when I had that moment of being introduced to Kip Winger and Reb Beach, and Kip saw how excited Reb was, he said, you know what, Rod? Um, come hell or high water, we are going to get a record deal because we're going to keep writing music, we're going to keep doing demos, and sooner or later, somebody is going to sign us. He said, I have a list of the 20 or 30 New York drummers that go to every cattle call audition. But since Reb is so excited uh, with you being here in this room, why don't we get together next week and jam and see what it feels like? Wow. You know, so... So that's what happened. Now, uh, the interesting thing is when I went in to audition, I was very uh, conscious of not wanting to turn them off by doing, the <laughs> yeah, by doing the things that fusion drummers do, which is yeah. play polyrhythms, play over the bar line, they throw in odd note groupings, or, you know, all these crazy kind of things. Yeah. And so... The first thing Kip did, he's the bass player as well as the singer, he came over to the drums and he just started pumping eighth notes on the bass, going junk, 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 junk. So I did what I thought he wanted to hear me do, which was what I call rock beat number one, which is kick on one, snare on two, kick on three, snare on four, and I did it with either a sloshy quarter note or eighth note ride pen. It's just a <laughs> and I hit the drums really hard. I didn't play a drum fill. I didn't leave the groove at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after a minute or so, Kip stopped playing and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I said, well, I'm, I'm doing what I thought you would expect me to do since you're just pumping eighth notes on the bass. What do you want me to do? So he said, Reb told me you could do crazy stuff. <laughs> so um, I said, well, I'm so concerned with not wanting to turn you off. I want to show you that I can hit hard and rock out. And so he said, I see that you could do it. That's really cool. But now... I'm going to go back to the pumping, lose me, or try to lose me. Do the things that you're known for in the Dixie Dregs. I said, you're kidding me. This is, <laughs> okay, this is awesome. How funny. Yeah, and so then I, you know, I started taking things out and out and out, and uh, you know, I, I couldn't lose him. You know, Kip is a very accomplished musician. I mean, he has this whole other life of writing I sat at Lincoln Center in New York City and watched the San Francisco ballet dance to his ballet called Ghosts. Wow. And Kip Kip is now in Czech as we speak, he's in Prague, Czechoslovakia with a fifty piece orchestra uh, that is recording music for him. He's involved in writing music for a musical called Get Jack based on the life of Jack the Ripper as sung through the women who, who he murdered. Oh, wow. So, um, Ballets and symphonies and musicals. How, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. So Kip has always studied classical music. Even when I met him, he was studying with, with people at uh, either the Eastman School of Music in New York City or Juilliard because uh, wow. he always he was always uh, very fascinated with orchestration. Um, and so anyway, so I guess I could say that um, I was asked to record on the first winger 
uh, as much due to the fact that I played weird, proggy, fusiony kinds of rhythmic things, as well as hitting the drums hard and keeping it simple. And um, I said, why are you asking me to do this? And he said, look, here's the deal. There are so many rock bands out there. And when we get a record deal, uh, he said, I'd like us to be able to kind of forge our own path where we have elements that fit perfectly with Kiss and Poison and Bon Jovi and Cinderella and Def Leppard. But he said, I think it would also be cool if there are things that we have in our band that none of those bands have. And there are no rock bands that have drummers that come from a fusion background. And so, and so not that I'm going to be asking you to do crazy things in every song, but there will definitely be moments in songs where we have you do things that nobody hears in rock music. And especially, that's really, especially that pop rock, you know, genre that you outlined with those bands that you did. He had very, really deep forethought and foresight on that, you know, to give it its own formula, give it its own stamp and its own sound and, and utilizing your expertise from your past to apply to it. It was, it was amazing. Um, and so wh when when we did that first record, and we did the song Headed for a Heartbreak, which has a long guitar solo at the end. When the guitar solo ends, it's kind of like, go crazy, do whatever you want. Do things that rock drummers don't do because it's just not in their realm of thinking. And then uh, the best example of uh, them having me utilize you know, those concepts from the fusion or prog rock world was uh, um, two measures after the guitar solo of the song 17. Uh -huh. That was the song that sent our album way past the million selling mark. Yeah. So um, we first cut the song and then uh, they got on the talk back. They said, okay, Rod, we want you to, we want you to play the song again. But after the guitar solo, uh, there's just a few measures of instrumental before the vocals come back in. We want you to do something that no one would ever think to do. So um, I said, all right, I have this idea. I don't know if you're going to like it, but here goes. And so, so I employed a concept that's called groove displacement. Mm -hmm. So ima imagine playing the beat um pa um um pa um pa um um pa but instead of starting it on the end on the downbeat of beat 1 play the same beat but start on the upbeat on the mm -hmm. end of beat 1 so so I did it normal for two measures and then I started it an eighth note later so it went 1 2 3 and 4 um mm, pa um mm, mm, pa then I went mm, mm, pa two, two, five, one, and two. And three and four and I just yeah. took this beat. I didn't make the beat any more syncopated. I just shifted, shifted it, it late yeah. by an eighth note, which in the fusion world is like beat displacement 101, right? Right. So w when I looked up, you know, through the control room, uh, double panes of glass. Nobody was there. They had all <laughs> fallen on the floor out of their chairs. Oh, in, wow. In hysterics. And they <laughs> loved it. And that's what made it to the record. And that's what's in the video. And yeah. the best part of that whole thing was when we finally hit the road, hit, yeah, and we were, we were on tour for the next year playing 230 some odd dates. I can't tell you how many hundreds of musicians would come up to me and say, what are you doing at that moment after the guitar solo? What time signature is that in? Why does it feel like the bottom drops out? Why does it sound like the music is turned upside down on its ears? And I found that 
fascinating and uh, very um, really rewarding, you know? Yeah. The, the fact that this thing that only lasts maybe four seconds um, became such an important part to the song. And one of those reasons why I was even asked to join the band. Yeah, it made such an impression on so many people and made you guys live in a genre of music where there, let's just say, is a sea of other bands that sound so much alike that to the even halfway trained ear might go, is that? No, it's, but Kip, again, had the forethought and the foresight to employ these little idiosyncrasies from your background that would help give Winger its own sound and its own mistakable sound and make people come up and ask you questions like that. Like one guy has a question here that I think fits perfectly right now. He says, let me find it again real quick. Bear with me here. Uh, because it's about time signature. Bear with me. Just take a second. I'm scanning, scanning, scanning. There's a lot more comments now. Um, and I'm sorry that I, I remember the question, but I wanted to find it to call out his name. Oh, here it is. So Greg Hampton says his snare hits make the 17 groove have an odd feel. And, and I believe there was someone else that said, how do you play in 17? And I know the obvious answer is, well, you count from 1 to 17. But... You know, maybe what he means is how do you? I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I think it's an interesting question, though. If it's perfectly here, both of those do the comment and the question. The entire song is in four four time. That's nuts. That's great. That's, that's the answer, and uh, you know, it's it's exciting um, and um, and a challenge sometimes to see what interesting things you can come up with when playing in 4-4 four, four, to make it sound like something else is happening. Gotcha. And Dalton's the other one I was looking for. So his actual question is, what is the time change in 17? There is no time change. It's There's all in, if you just clap it, you know. It goes straight through the song. Da, 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 it's very syncopated, and the riff that I do that weird thing against goes. Boom! Yeah! See songs fly. It's all four four. It never changes. Never. Wow! So there you go, Dalton. There's no time change. That's great. You're, um, sh you're shifting where you are starting the groove. It's the same groove, but instead of, say, starting it here on one, I'm waiting till the end of one and starting the groove there. Yeah, that's great. It is still on 4-4. Four, four. That makes sense. Okay, and now the other thing that I found fascinating when I would try to explain this to all of these musicians and drummers that would come up to me after our shows, I would start rattling off drummers' names like Steve Smith, Dave West, Simon lost. Phillips, Dave Caliuda, yeah. you know, on and on and on and on. Okay. Sorry, so so I, I would rattle off. Yeah, Steve Smith, Dave Weckl, Vinny Caliuta, Simon, Simon Phillips. Phillips, on and on and on. Who, whoever I would mention, never once did anybody ever hear of any of those people. Oh, wow. Well, that they, kind of they, makes sense if you they might, the genre. Maybe they heard of Steve Smith if they knew of Journey. Journey, yeah. But not Steve Smith from Steps Ahead or... Right. From from the things that he does his to this day, stuff, yeah. where his where his passion lies. So yeah. these are people who they never heard of the Dixie Dregs. They just assumed I'm the drummer in this new band Winger, and it's my first thing. My yeah, first. You worked at a grocery store. Yeah. Got discovered. You know. 
Yeah. The only, really, I mean, the only fusion drummer that, you know, I'm saying fusion that they may have heard of uh, was Neil Peart. Yeah. Because, you know, because they knew who Rush was. They had a bit of a progressive edge to their rock music. And it's yeah. really interesting because, again, I think it's a great example of, I'd like to sometimes do posts on our Facebook page where we'll ask a question that has to do with listing your favorite whatever. Like, what drummer would you like to spend a week with? You know, things like that. And I tell people, if you if you see names that you're not familiar with, look them up. There's a reason why people are listing them. And it may not completely envelop your musical sensibilities as a musician or a music fan, but you will learn something and expose yourself to some new stuff that even if you could take one thing away from, like for instance, in the 80s and stuff, you I was in a snobby prog rock band and you'd never catch me listening to Tears for Fears or the B-52s or, you know, any of that. And I love those bands now, you know, right. so it, they're, it's so important to really open your mind and look beyond where you're standing right now in your musical you know, world, I think. And that's a great example of that. It is very true. Now, it's also important um, to try to understand the situations that you are getting yourself into. Um, if you want to be a musician who is continually called and hired to do things, try to give the people that are hiring you the kind of drumming that they're looking for. Don't feel that you need to educate them. So if, Good point. So if someone's hiring you to play in an ACDC kind of band, do not show them that you know how to displace a groove by shifting it over by an eighth note. Right, or you're a great double you, pedal drummer. Yeah, no, no, you you will be booted out as quickly as you sat, sat down yeah. at the drums. Now, you know, going back to something you had said a half hour ago, um, see, I, see, I believe knowledge is power and um, we should try to expose ourselves to as much music as possible you know, running the gamut of, of, of every style and try to understand what it is that makes each style of music tick. And, and as it pertains to drums, what are the, the elements of the drumming that make that style of music sound the way it does? So that if, if you do have an opportunity to play in a straight ahead, you know, hard hitting uh, genre like ACDC, you know exactly the tools to draw from, which might be this many tools, even though you, you, you know, are capable of this. Yes. But you don't want to use this in the ACDC setting because then it doesn't sound like ACDC. Right. Well, the more knowledge that you have, in addition to helping you uh, sound um, like you should be sounding in these different styles of music, you may have those opportunities where you can bring in elements from these other styles into the ACDC style that you're playing in if you are asked to do it. Exactly. As I was in Winger. But like, yeah. like I said, to try to get the gig when I heard junk, 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 it's like, all right, I know I can do all this other stuff, but I'm hearing just this pumping on the bass. I'm going to play what I think this guy is looking for me to give him. Right. So you have to be, you have to be smart about the knowledge that you are, um, you know, taking in and, and building. Yeah, and, and it's, it's so great. Your mama. Yeah, and what's different today is sort of a double-edged thing. And what I mean by that is the good news is that everything is accessible. It's easy to go out and find this stuff 
in any shade, any hue, any texture that you want. Even ones you're not familiar with, that's what we're talking about. That's the good news. The other side of the coin is that when I was growing up and just started playing the drums, music was not segregated on the radio, on the, radio the way it is now. So rather than having to go out and look for all these different things, and honestly, being seven and eight years old, I didn't, wouldn't have known any better anyways, but my point is, growing, growing up in L.A., in Los Angeles, and I think it's still there, there was an AM radio music station called KHJ, 93KHJ, I even remember the jingle. And I'd put my headphones on, and I'd play for an hour to whatever came on. And one song might be Three Dog Night, then it might be Neil Diamond, then it might be Rod Stewart and the Faces. Then it might be Linda Ronstadt. Then it might be Bobby Sherman. It was just one different thing after another. And to me, I didn't know the difference between these nuances between the different genres. It was just music, and I was learning all these different things, which was great then. And, and what's great now is that you can find anything that's out there, but you have to make the effort and have the open mind to want to go look for it. And I, again, I think the best way to do that is to to talk to other musicians. You know, in, on Facebook, there's all these different music groups that are based on different genres that you can learn. What, what's out there in the new wave world still? What's out there in the punk rock world or what was there? What's out there in fusion? And, you know, it goes on and on and on. So if you can listen to B-52s one moment, Gentle Giant the next moment, and take something away from each, you're winning, you know? Fill in that mm -hmm. toolbox. And by the way, I think a good, really, mm -hmm. sum of that equation is John Weathers, the drummer for Gentle Giant, who was Welsh, was, is one of the funkiest drummers I've ever heard. And he's in this crazy, outlandish, you know, progressive rock band that incorporated all kinds of crazy stuff. Ah, but that's a whole other discussion. So what's happening with Winger now? New tour? Yes, um, Winger. Uh, the the Dregs tour was a was a bus tour where we just went from city to city to city, doing like six shows a week, um, which can be very taxing uh, after a while, especially when you get a little bit older. Winger has in recent years begun to tour differently, where we do fly-in dates. So. You fly out on a Thursday to play Friday in one city. You get up early, fly to the next city, and maybe you do a third city. So in the course of a weekend, you're doing two to three shows, and then you go back home. I love uh, touring that way. Uh, it can also take its toll because, you know, there's always delays at airports. Occasionally you have a headache of, of a flight being canceled, and you have to, you know, figure out logistics you know, very, very quickly. Um, but so, you know, starting actually next week, um, you know, Winger will play a couple of weekends in September. Um, we'll play all through November and then a chunk of December and probably a bunch next year as well. And then wow. we'll also we'll probably talking about doing some new music. Um, oh, wow. You know, since the heyday, Winger has done three or four, uh, you know, albums of new music, which to me, some of it is like truly magnificent. But, you know, radio has changed. <laughs> they have Hair Nation that plays 17 and other songs all the time. And so it's very difficult uh, outside of your core audience to... Um, you know, to get your music yeah. to, to other people or a new audience. But uh, the reason you continue to do new music is for the core audience and just to let people know that you're still alive and well and tapping into the creative side, you know, of who you are as a musician. Right. And before we go on with, and, and folks, hang in there. And if you're just joining us, hang in there. And be sure to rewind and watch this after it posts and archives on the Jump Talk TV page because we're covering a lot of ground. Before we move on to some other projects, including being on American Pickers, which is a, a great show that my wife and I have been huge fans of for a, a long time, 
On the Dixie Dregs tour was a live album recorded, and on the Winger tour might there be a live album recorded? Um, there were plans for it, and then in the middle of the of the Dixie Dregs tour, we we decided to not record. Uh -huh. Why anything. is that? If I might ask, I think because um, it would have it would have taken a lot of post production hours to get things to a point where everybody would have been happy. And we thought as much as it would be nice for posterity to have something in the can for the time being, we just opted not to do that. Okay. Um, with winger, you know, the last time we played in Japan a year or so back, um, we did record uh, one or two of those shows. So I'm not sure if that has been released yet or if at some point, it will. Okay. Will. I, I, I ask that because I always try to wear the fan's hat, and I know people would want to know that question for both fans. And I'm thinking it's been three, three years, maybe four, since I saw you with Winger, with uh, my, our buddy Terry Gwynn, who I went to high school with, and who made your wonderful uh, drum mixer. I think that was three or four years ago, so I can't wait to see you. If you come out to Arizona, I can't wait to see you on tour again. Maybe. Well, you know, it's funny you mention it. Um, next Saturday, I believe, we're playing in Flagstaff. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. That's oh, wow. I'll have to look at the, We'll talk about that. I'll see if I yeah, can okay. It's and, and it's... I'm sorry, I was just going to say, it's kind of far, but if I have the time, I don't care. We love road trips. I'll have to see if I can get there. It'd be great. Okay. Um, it's so great that you mentioned Terry Gwynn, because it would be great just to give him a, a shout out. Um, yeah. Some years ago, I received a gift uh, in the mail where this guy took a floor tom and turned it into a work of art, this beautiful coffee table where he lined it with all different photographs of me and uh, and then etched my name in the glass that sits Tom. on of the Tom Tom. Yeah. And he lined it with lights. And it was, it was from this person who, uh, I, I don't think I knew him back then. It was Harry. And uh, he just sent it to me saying, hey, I've, you know, I've been a longtime fan and please accept this as a token of my appreciation for all the years of, you know, the great music right. you have given me. So, you know, I thanked him profusely and then we stayed in touch over the years. And then um, I was in my garage trying to clean some things out and uh, I opened some very old road cases and pulled out my first two drum sets, which were these four piece Ludwig kits. Um, the very first kit being black lacquer and the second kit being psychedelic red. If you're familiar with that finish, it's a, a swirl of blue, green and red. Yeah, like a bowling ball finish almost. Kinda, yes. Yeah. So um, they were in such bad shape because the foam that was in these road cases had disintegrated over the 20 some odd years since I had even seen inside them. And, and so all this foam broke up into tiny specks and had ad adhered to the drum. And then what of the drums you could see was this yellowed chrome and it just looked horrible. And um, I think most people would have just brought the drums to the curb for garbage collection. So, um, so I made contact with Terry and said, hey, Terry, I've got these, you know, eight drums, which are my first two drum sets. Um, I don't know if they're salvageable, but if they are, it would be so cool to come up with some sort of conversation piece that could be done with them. So Terry said, ship them to me. So here I am on the East Coast. He so lives in, in California. California. I shipped the drums to him. He refurbished them to like their original brilliance. And we talked about 
lining each of the drums with photos of my drumming idols and then um, suspending them somehow underneath a thick piece of beveled glass like a big coffee table um, so that you know I could see them 24 7 if I like and so um, when he completed the job months and months later he said Rod I don't trust shipping these back to you I'm renting a Winnebago I'm driving cross country <laughs> delivering this to you what a gangster and then he spent a few hours at my house assembling them. It's one of the most magnificent, you know, works of art I own. Yeah. And, you know, and, and there's lights on the glass and the drums, each of the drums that has the photographs of the drummer has the name of the drummer embossed and the drum head on the bottom. It, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. What he, what he did. He did an amazing job. He's done some other really wonderful work since with drums and with guitars and basses and, and everything. So I actually, while you were talking, I shared this to his page. Um, and oh, I'll wonderful. hit him up and let him know about where in the interview it is. Not that he wouldn't want to watch the whole thing. But Terry, if you're if you are watching right now live, chime in to the comments. Um, that's awesome. So again, let's, let's shift gears and talk about And look for Rod on tour with Winger. Uh, you will leave with a smile on your face, absolutely. Uh, and you can ask him about 17 if you go to the meet and greet. <laughs> but let's talk about the other things you have going on uh, with American Pickers, and you've, you've got a re-release of some material. What else is happening? Um, about a month ago, I recorded with Jordan Rudis. Jordan is the keyboard player with Dream Theater. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he and I through the years have had this duo that we call the Rudis Morgenstein Project, where we play as a two piece. And, um, uh, you know, we haven't been able to do that in the last three or four years, just because our lives have us all over the map doing other things. But he's been in the process of recording his new solo record. And uh, he asked me if I would um, record drums on about half of it, uh, which of course, you know, I said, yeah, send me the music. And then, of course, you know, he sent me the music. And then, you know, I questioned my agreeing to do it because I know, you know, with Jordan, um, he sometimes writes some of the most uh, most challenging rhythmic music that I've ever experienced in my life. And so there's really this one song that's about a 10 or 11 minute piece that when I finished my chart for it, um, when I write charts for music I do with Jordan, he doesn't really write like introduction, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, chorus, chorus, chorus. It's more like section A, section B, section C, section D. Hopefully section A will come back at some point. <laughs> so when I finished this chart, you know, it was about 10 pages long and it went to the letter Z. Oh, wow. And through the course of these 26 sections, I believe three of them repeated. Wow. And so, you know, I, I jokingly will say I really didn't have a summer this <laughs> summer because I spent all of June and most of July making sense of <laughs> that song of so that so that when i went, went in the studio I, I i could just nail it and so, so uh you know so of course those, here i am with those three repeated pieces the chorus <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i i don't know uh if if that particular song has choruses <laughs> <laughs> what um, a nice musical journey that sounds like oh my god he he's a one of a kind he has so much music inside of him and I've I've worked side by side with him you know doing our own Brutus Morgenstein recording and then we did a live uh, recording years ago that had some new music and just you know 
sitting next to him and watching how quickly he can come up with something mm -hmm. is, it's truly astounding. That's cool. That's really, and it's gotta be great to work with that. Yes. Oh awesome. yeah. Cool, what else? Well, let's see, um, 20, about 20 years ago, um, I had written a book called The Drum Set Musician with Rick Mattingly, who, um, you know, was the original editor of Modern Drummer magazine. And I think uh, he's currently the editor of Percussive Notes uh, for the Percussive Arts Society. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought we would write a drum book together. And uh, it's, it's, it's very flattering that Modern Drummer some years ago made a list uh, of what they call the 25 drum books you must own. And so the drum set musician is listed in that list of 25. And so um, about two years ago, Hal Leonard Publishing, who put out the book, they asked if, uh, since we were coming close to the 20 year anniversary of the book, uh, would we consider doing a, 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 like a second edition of the book, um, sort of uh, um, adding some more play along tracks to the 14 tracks that are on. So I wrote four more songs uh, that are on it and then went through the book page by page um, and made um, changes uh, to various things throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we spent the last year and a half or so doing that and it has recently just been released. Oh, great. Yeah, so that's uh, very exciting. Where can um, people find it? Can they find it on Amazon or go to howletter.com? Yeah, both, both okay. places. Great. They can find and hopefully Modern Drummer will do a review of it since it, it is a second edition of it. Um, uh, I haven't done a second edition yet of the drum set warm ups book, but uh, you know, it's another book that I'm extremely proud of because I think it is the first and only book of its kind in the drumming world. Every musical instrument has endless books uh, that consist of exercises that strengthen the different muscle groups um, on, for the instrument that you play. And most musicians, when they sit down with their instrument, before they start jamming or going through literature, they will run through a series of scales and arpeggios on their instrument. Now, they're doing these things not because then if they go jam, they're going to go da 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 But there's a reason that we go through these scales and arpeggios because it works on the different um, the different aspects of playing the musical instrument that are imperative to playing that instrument. And so many years ago, in my frustration with being a drum set player, I would start making up exercises that would focus on one thing or another that was bothering me. I'm left-handed. My right side is so much weaker. So with just my right hand, I just started coming up with a series of wacky motions, patterns of motions to try to strengthen my weak side. Mm -hmm. And then I would add my weak foot to it and on and on and on and on. And so over the course of years, several years, I had amassed all these scrap pieces of paper <laughs> with, with these various patterns of motion or exercises that I found were helping me in, in the different um, aspects of playing the drums that I felt I needed help with. And so about 15 years into it or 20 years into it, I sat down one day on my drum pad with my drum set two feet in front of me and I was warming up and I looked at the pad and I looked at the drum set and I said, why am I warming up on a slab of rubber that's glued to this block of wood when that's not the instrument that I play, that's the instrument I play, the drum set. And when I sit down at the drum set, why am I not doing any scales or arpeggios or drum set equivalent of scales and arpeggios? Why do I only do that like this? And then I go on the drum set, which you play like this, <laughs> and you use your legs, but you don't do any exercises to develop the four limbs. Yeah. And so, that was this 
moment, this light bulb moment of realizing, oh my goodness, there's no such thing as a drum set warm up book as there is Hannon for piano, which I used all my life as a piano player. And every other musical instrument has its warm up books, you know, dozens of them, hundreds of them. So, so I, I went looking for all my scraps of paper and then spent, you know, a couple of years putting together the book called Drum Set Warm Ups that it, it, it uh, published by Ber- Berkeley's uh, Berkeley's book division. And so um, both of these books um, in the rock drums course that I created for Berkeley's online division. It's very easy to sort of uh, get a little information on that. It, you just go to online.berkeley.edu. They have this ever-growing online division of 12-week courses that people around the world can take either for three credits, as more and more institutions are accepting college courses that are taken online, or if somebody just wants to audit the course get a certificate or just to take a course, they could do it that way. And so um, I created this 12 week course that is uh, this very intensive course on rock drumming that involves hours and hours of video that was shot, hundreds of uh, two and four and eight measure transcriptions of, of drum patterns from like nearly 300 different songs and uh, pages and pages of copy. It, it's the most labor intensive undertaking I have ever been part of in my life. Wow. Far beyond any recording that I've ever done. It, it took about 1500 hours That's when I- crazy, wow. It wow. But it runs, it runs four times a year, you know, cause they're 12 weeks long. And, uh, you know, drummers from all over the globe take the course and it's, you know, you go at your own pace and then once a week they have what's called a live chat where I'm just like what we're doing here, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever students are available, uh, wherever it is that they're living in the world, uh, we hang out and talk about drums or whatever they want to talk about. And then uh, every week uh, they submit their assignment where they have to demonstrate a couple of things and play along uh, to a track of which there's usually several that they can uh, choose from and they have to answer a discussion question. It, it's really the future of learning, you know, and it's the next best thing to being able to be in a room yeah. uh, teacher with teacher and student. I, I think it's a, one, a wonderful uh, It makes it so much more accessible to everybody, which is great. That is awesome. Cool. Tell us about American Pickers. That's that's big time TV stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see. A, a few years ago, um, like I do all the time, I went in uh, on my in my beautiful town into Main Street, and I eat at the sweet shop where the ex-mayor Pete cooks me my blueberry pancake with an egg on it and a glass of milk and a cup of coffee. And so um, the one day I went in there and he said, my niece is married to a German man who was in the music business, and he he's very interested in meeting you. And he burned you know, down Atlanta. This is, this is up here. Yeah, right. Yeah, he burned down Atlanta. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah. Funny. So, um, I said, "Oh, that's great." So one day when I went in, uh, a couple of weeks later, I met Axel, mm-hmm. who who told me that for many years he was a very successful recording engineer, and he worked with people like Elton John. And P. Diddy, but he said technology kind of has ended the careers of many people like himself because now anybody who has a laptop and Pro Tools 
can call themselves an engineer and they don't need me anymore. So he, so he told me that if he wanted to stay in music, he had to reinvent himself. And so he partnered up with a couple of guys and they started a music house and they were trying to amass music that they would then try to place wherever they could place it, whether it's radio commercials, TV commercials, TV shows, movies. He said, would you be interested in writing music to start building a library? And I said, uh, well, I guess yes and no. I'm not really interested in putting in time and effort for getting nothing in return because you don't have anything yet. But how about when such a day comes that you have the potential of placing music somewhere, then uh, we could talk about creating music. So he said, all right, sounds fair. So a year or so later, um, I got together with him with a friend of mine who's a production guy and a guitarist and uh, um, just a talented musician all around. And he said, well, have you heard of the TV show American Pickers? And uh, I guess we kind of had heard of it. And he said, they are not 100% happy with the company that's pr providing all the music for them. And uh, they would like us to start submitting music for their show. Wow. So, my, so my friend and I started writing music and a bunch of it has been used, been used on the show. Awesome. So, when um, did they start using it? I want to try to get a reference. My wife and I it's, don't yeah, watch much TV, but we love that show. Yeah, I would say it was really like, not this past year, but the year before, okay. that, that they used a lot, of, a lot of our things. We haven't written music for it um, in the last year or so, but we're, we're talking about getting back to doing it. That's awesome. Uh, I definitely watched that period. It's, that's that's cool, and I think back to the music and stuff. I'll have to pull up that season. Yeah, the thing is, you know, the music is in the background, and uh, I'm sorry, and they they that use again? like a music the clip, clip will down. be anywhere from a they, sure the you know the music in that show um, is kind of buried down. Um, yeah. And in the course of a 30 minute show, there might be 140 different pieces of what they call original music. Yeah. The songs have nothing to do with each other. And if a piece of music might last anywhere from three seconds to 10 seconds. Yeah, and for reactions and transitions and different things like that. Yeah, in fact, when I, when I was told before we even started writing, yeah, go watch the show, I'd watch it. And I wasn't even aware there was music in it. <laughs> um, but there are so many cable shows um, that require music, and so more and more people are trying to get their feet wet getting into it. But um, again, you know, this didn't happen. Just like the winger thing didn't happen because I went to an audition. I just happened to be introduced to Kip and Reb. Here I got involved writing music for American Pickers because – the breakfast place that I go into, yeah. you know, uh, the owner's niece happened to be married to someone that got involved with American Pickers. Um, so you never going, know, folks. That's a you, great example. You just never you know. You never know. Uh, and, and the main thing is uh, to try to be out and about as much as you can so that the, oppor the potential opportunities at least have – uh, a way of maybe finding themselves to you. If yeah. you just if you just sit at home, twiddling your thumbs, it won't happen. You have to kind of be out there. Be out there for opportunity to find you. Let's look and see if there's any new questions. Uh, bear with me here. Let's see. I'll start at the. Trying to figure out which way is the newest. And my, my slider's not working. Here we go. There we go. Okay. So, okay. So Chuck Cervente, 
who is in Page, Arizona, says, I have a question for Rod. What do you think about some of the newer metal bands? For example, Chris Adler from Lamb of God and, you know, some drummers and bands from those eras. Are you tapped in to stuff like that? Do you hear Well, you know, um, through my teaching at Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, more and more students over the past, say, five to ten years um, have come in for their lessons, and this is the music that they are passionate about. So I've been turned on to a lot of music through through the students. That's I've, great. And, um, I, you know, whereas a lot of the music is not necessarily, say, my cup of tea where, you know, after, after a day of doing whatever, if I want to, like, chill, I don't... I don't really go in for listening to this incredibly intense, um, you know, blistering paced music, but I have the utmost of appreciation for the amount of practice and, and time that goes into uh, being able to play and create this. Yeah, kind of Bill, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm not a blast beat guy, but I hate no music. I have the same thing, the utmost appreciation for what it took for those guys and girls to get to that ability doing that thing. And people comment on our page all the time when we post videos like that, where's the groove? Not believe it or not, and groove is great, believe me, but not everything is built around groove. Jazz was not built around groove, you know, so... It's, yeah. You hit it on the head where there, there's such a great appreciation that we have an opportunity for if, again, we have open minds and have an open radar. So, this, I mean, this music did not exist 20 years ago. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, and that says a lot when a new genre can be born and forge a path for itself. That says a lot about the musicians. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful. And uh, it's terrible to... Um, to live with a closed mind where you think that the only good music is your music. Right. So look, I'm, I'm still most passionate about the music that, um, that was going on in the late sixties and early seventies. It's still my favorite music, but, but who am I to try to um, push that on younger generations that's right that's my generation's music yeah. and um and and young people should have their music and good for them that their music doesn't sound like my music or our yeah. music you know? yeah it's evolution um someone's asking where did it go i uh, says greg hampton again says i like 12 foot ninja uh, definitely a mix of influences and styles. Are you familiar with 12 Foot Ninja? I'm not. Oh, they're really cool, really fun to listen to. Um, Kevin Hall says, and bear with me because I'm previewing to make sure it's nothing too crazy. Oh. <laughs> Since you mentioned Cozy Powell, he sounded great on Brian May's solo stuff, uh, Back to the Light. Yeah, Cozy was great, absolutely. He was great. When I, when I moved to New York City in 1986, I remember being in, uh, oh, I, I can't remember what the club was, but it was like on the 30th floor in Midtown. So it was a very famous club, maybe in an Indian restaurant. And there, lo and behold, sitting at the bar was Cozy Powell, and we had a really nice conversation. Oh, wow. How cool. Yeah. I miss Cozy. We lost yeah, him great, way too great early. Time. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so, Brett Broadway, Brett, if you're still watching, please add to your comment. I'm not sure what you're referring to, if it's the educational stuff. Maybe it's the educational stuff. There's no timestamp on the comment. But Brett's asking, any talk of ever releasing a putting... Oh, I get it now. Sorry. Any talk of ever releasing putting it all together on DVD? Uh, I, uh, I think that conversation might have come up years ago, but nothing since. You know, that video, that video came out in 1988. I can't believe it's 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know that it would ever come out in DVD. It might just be too many years ago, but thank you for even mentioning. I'm, I'm very proud of that video. A lot of effort went into uh, putting it together. Are you familiar? Absolutely. Are you familiar with animals as leaders? Sure. Oh, what do you think of them? Somebody's asking. Yeah, terrific. Correct. That's a terrific band. Uh, a lot of my students at Berkeley are, are fans. But I, I, have, I keep mentioning Berkeley. I retired this year from the college. So I've been making, you know, like 16 or 17,000 miles a year for the past 20 years of treks from Long Island, New York, up to Boston to teach there 30 weeks a year. Wow. And, um, and I just retired this year after exactly 20 years of doing it. I will continue to teach the online course, Rock Drums. That's cool. But I won't, I, I'm no longer at the college, you know, in the flesh. There, there's a friend, speaking of Berkeley, there's a friend of mine who, and I've made so many great friends through Drum Talk TV all over the world. Thank you, everybody, for becoming personal friends. And anybody's welcome, you know, I really love that aspect of social media and the internet. Uh, Brenda Figliola has a young son named Gino, and uh, they met you at Berkeley, and she says, we love Rod Morgenstein. Hi, Rod, from Gino and Rocco. They met you at Berkeley. Hey, how, how are you all doing? I remember they all came to my classroom. Yeah, you remember that? Sure, and we took pictures, and we hung out. That's cool. That's wonderful. Great. Well, Rod, thank you so much for taking so much time. I know that you and I can talk career and drumming and swap stories and philosophy and everything about music forever. So we'll have to have you back, maybe even on a somewhat regular basis, which would be cool. And thank you, everybody, for watching and participating, whether you hung in here from the beginning or you're watching on the archive replay. Uh, we really appreciate it. And Rod, I don't know if you're going to be at the NAMM show, but ooh, I don't know if I can say this yet. I'll say it. It's not the official announcement, but here's a little leak. Drum Talk TV, we're going to have our own booth at the NAMM show as exhibiting wow. media. I'd love for you to come by, do a live interview, maybe sit down for a while, do some autograph signing on drum heads with some other great drummers, and, and uh, just visit with us in person. It's been a while since we've had a hug. Right. That sounds good. You know what? The, the one other thing that I don't think I mentioned is I hope also that in the coming year, um, John Mayung, Ty Tabor and I, who comprise the Jelly Jam, uh, will hopefully be getting together to start working on new music. Wow, also. that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Keep us posted, please. Will do, for that sure. That would be great. Maybe we can... Uh, tap into a live rehearsal and interview the three of you doing something. That'd really be cool. That'd be great. Yeah, sure. that'd be awesome. So please keep me posted on that. All right, Dan. All right, and hang out after I sign off with the Drum Talk TV uh, channel. Again, thanks everybody so much for joining Rod and myself here on Drum Talk TV. And you can see tons of more interviews, event coverage, documentaries uh, in the video section of the Drum Talk TV Facebook page on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash drum talk TV channel, believe it or not. And our website, would you believe it? It's drum talk TV.com. We've got a lot of great things happening this year. So sign up for the newsletter, be the first to know, and we'll see you soon, everybody. Thanks. Thanks everybody. <laughs>